Thanks so much for all the comments on the first two parts of my look at how the Meghan Markle and Harry documentary has been made. Uh, I don't want to comment too much on the actual editorial or get drawn into the arguments because it's clearly very personal and quite upsetting to all parties, I suspect. But I just want to look at how the programme is made from a storytelling perspective, and I think that's really interesting. So let's get right into it. I often talk about the orphan warrior hero journey and how that helps any member of the audience empathise with the protagonist. We see the main character as an orphan and then we follow them as they become a warrior and we see them fight their way through some situation where they're facing adversity and then hopefully they come out of it as a hero at the end and I always maintain that this can apply to any genre any story told anywhere in any culture in the world from the wonderful Who Wants to Be a Millionaire which is a game show we see the contestant come in they're in a gladiatorial area they're lit by a pin spot they look lonely frightened they're on their own they're an orphan then they start answering questions and they become a warrior and then hopefully they go and win some money and even if they fail well, what's better than uh, an heroic failure? We all love that. So Orphan Warrior Hero, very important part of storytelling. If you look at Star Wars, Star Wars is a very classic in relation to Luke, Orphan Warrior Hero story. Luke goes off on Tatooine and he comes back to find a little curl of smoke in the distance coming from where his homestead was and his guardians have been uh, killed by somebody as yet unknown and he is literally an orphan. He then goes off and joins the resistance, becomes a warrior and then fights through to the end to what I think is a fairly awful scene where they all get medals and he's literally become a hero, Orphan Warrior Hero. The pre-titles of this particular documentary are all about Megan. This particular episode, episode four, is going to be Megan's story. And it's casting her as the orphan. It's casting her as the outsider. It's casting her as the fish out of water about how she's joined a culture that she's um, a foreign organism. Uh, I think is the expression that they use. You know, she's not quite the sort of person that the royal family or this institution has come to expect to welcome into their midst. She's an orphan. She's out of place. And, of course, the racial element creeps in where we talk about her being mixed race. So she's an orphan. That's just in the pre-title sequence, setting up the leading principal character in this particular part of the documentary as an orphan. With this particular documentary, where the playhead is on the actual narrative, the point in time of the story, is behind where we know it now to be in real life. In other words, we've moved on slightly. We know some of the outcome. So how do you still make that dramatic? How do you still manage to make people watch? Well, it's a classic technique called waiting for the crash. Human beings all suffer with a terrible thing called negative bias. We all like to see the bad things. It powers our insatiable scrolling through social media. In between all the little pictures of puppy dogs <laughs> looking terribly cute, we also see people banging their knees on door frames and going, ah! We like that. It plays to our negativity bias. Somebody once described it as when you rub a neck on a motorway, people want to see, not the view on this side of the Cheviot Hills or whatever it happens to be, you want to see the poor people broken down on the side of the road, um, and we hope not worse. Uh, that's why people rub a neck. It's interesting as well, when I was at the BBC, I used to get letters, maybe three or four letters, complaining about a programme, because people write to complain these programmes were watched by millions of people. I didn't get any letters saying, oh, thank you, I really enjoyed that programme on Saturday night. It was just a game show, Dog Eat Dog or whatever it happened to have been, Weakest Link even. But if there was a question that was slightly controversial, longest river in the world, Amazon or Nile, discuss, um, then people would write in and complain because they didn't like the outcome because people are always biased towards the negativity. Waiting for the crash is a little bit the same kind of principle when you're scrolling through the internet and you see two, a lovely young couple 
at the altar, getting married, looking lovingly into each other's eyes, you stop, not because you want to look at the loving photo, at the positive side of it, that we're convinced the groom is either just about to faint and fall over and cause huge embarrassment, or the, the, the bride is going to vomit all over her lovely dress. And it will make us laugh or make us go, oh my gosh, but that was fantastic because it plays into our negativity bias. So waiting for the crash, the first 23 minutes of this documentary is about Megan, the rock star, about how she is proving to be a fantastic asset to the royal family, about all the positive things, about a fairy tale, about the positive things that they, the, as a couple, could go on to do for their charities and for all of the good stuff. There is no greater authority or authority bias than for Piers Morgan to say she has become uh, the royal rock star but then to temper that with, is it a good thing? So waiting for the crash. We know the outcome. We know it's not good. We're watching all this good stuff and we're totally gripped because we know at some point the question we're all asking in our heads is going to be asked and then hopefully answered. Where did it all go wrong? The crash. And I think it's at about 23.20 almost exactly, where Abigail Spencer, who's a friend, says what we're all thinking. I don't understand. It all seemed to be going so well. It was amazing. The crash happens. And then the rest of the documentary is about what that crash was all about. There are some clues um, into the kind of conflicts and where we kind of go with this, even during the, uh, the good part while we're waiting for the crash and we're looking at those lovely wedding photos. There's a part where Prince Harry says, we decided to have a gospel choir and there wasn't much pushback. This already sets the seed for, they can't always do what they want. They can't just say, let's have a gospel choir and everybody goes, yay, great. Prince Harry has said that he never wanted the interview of his mother ever played again. In one of the previous episodes, he says that she was tricked or deceived into giving that interview by Martin Bashir. And I think it's been proved that there was an element of deception over the bank statements. But the fact is, that same interview is used to prove the point that Harry and Meghan are making about life behind closed doors in the royal family. I just want to talk about two other slightly annoying aspects of the techniques used on this. First of all, there's kind of the, often the odd anomaly, the, uh, the odd discrepancy. Certainly the whole thing about using Princess Diana to underlie the point or that interview to underlie the point is, is a slight anomaly. Another one is the fact that Prince Harry mentions that Charles helped choose the gospel choir and yet the gospel child, uh, choir was something about which there was no pushback. Well, who would that pushback have come from? Clearly not Prince Charles as he helped choose it. So I don't understand. I don't understand where that pushback came from or who that comment is even aimed at and that should be made clearer by the producers of the documentary the other thing is a very clumsy technique where they use overlaid pictures harry is very careful to use the word they when clearly he's talking about somebody that he has in his mind's eye but then the pictures that are overlaid in this particular instance are of kate and king charles prince charles as he was then and you kind of think well is that what Harry's asked them to do, because that's who he's told them he's talking about. Have the programme makers just assumed that's who he's talking about, so they're the pictures he's used? Or have the programme makers just clumsily used any old pictures of what they consider to be the establishment? I think if you're making a documentary, you have to be extremely clear about to whom, which or what you're referring to, and that it isn't made entirely clear in this documentary. In much the same way that one of the experts talk about you have to look at the evidence. The evidence are the headlines that they're kind of complaining about in the first place. Now, yes, there's some degree of evidence that those headlines were following a narrative, but how 
much of a conspiracy theory one wants to put behind that is really the question that we're asking. Was there a conspiracy theory? Were the press offices in competition with each other? And were they briefing against each other, planting stories, telling lies, and all of that kind of stuff? That, that's what I want the evidence of. You can't just say, here's a headline, that's evidence that it was happening, because it isn't. We need some clear proof that, uh, and rigour behind that proof that People in the differing houses, press camps, were briefing against each other. And the actual end result of that, which are those headlines, is not conclusive enough. So there are a couple of the weak points that I think uh, about the kind of overall argument without getting into the editorial and just the editorial techniques used behind it. Um, but hopefully the takeaway from this is that whole thing of about the crash and the fact that we wait for the crash and that's what keeps us engaged and indeed the whole notion of negative bias because I think that's really quite fascinating. Why we enjoy the negative and don't celebrate the positive is a human condition that is not great. If you want to hear more about the inside workings of television, or maybe you're looking at a career in television, there's some more videos, and all you have to do is subscribe to my YouTube channel, and you can get all of that right here, right now. <laughs>